This story is based on alleged accounts without concrete evidence and may be viewed as science fiction. It is presented for entertainment and discussion purposes only, and we do not endorse or support any claims made. Viewers should conduct their own research and form their own opinions. In a previous episode, it was mentioned that James Vincent Forrestal, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, had difficulty accepting the notion that extraterrestrial beings could be the true deities, instead of merely a group of aliens. In this video, we will continue this conversation. He met with Air Force Secretary Stuart Symington, which accelerated his downfall, and later he jumped off a building. The official story is that he fell on his own. And I don't know the truth, but I do know that people like him. When they learn information that is beyond their acceptable range, do end up going down a path of destruction. James Vincent Forrestal was the first U.S. Secretary of Defense, and committed suicide by jumping off a building in 1949. The reason for his suicide is still unclear. Conspiracy theorists believe that his death was related to aliens. Are there others who have suffered unfortunate fates? Yes, but not many, because there are very few people who know the truth. Sometimes when I read papers written by UFO experts or see media reports on the Dulce issue, I find that these people are just talking nonsense. Apart from a very small number of witnesses, the truth that most people come into contact with is actually fake, because not many witnesses will reveal secrets. They are carefully screened and selected and have a high level of confidentiality. Moreover, these hires are mostly lifelong. Once you enter the Dulce job, you will never leave for the rest of your life. This kind of employment relationship originated from Lanel and has been extended to many places, Aztec, Roswell, Farmington, but it started in San Antonio. San Antonio, Texas? No. San Antonio, New Mexico, a town with the same name. The military witnessed the Greys flying saucer there. And they had established stable contact with the Greys. But the fact that the Greys had a flying saucer still shocked the military. Because the Greys had never mentioned it to them. The military also never found any information about the Greys' flying saucer from the discoveries of the Moloch expedition. Once, AB-29 discovered a crashed Grey alien spacecraft near Alamogordo with a dead Grey pilot. The military later learned that their high-power radar had threatened the alien spacecraft, causing some kind of electromagnetic emission anomaly. The specific technical details can be found in the Diana project. So the crashed UFO in New Mexico was not related to weather, but to radar interference. Therefore, at that time, the military could be said to have deliberately used radar technology to threaten the greys and prevent them from flying in the air at will. Accidents occurred in many places, such as Socorro, Roswell, and Aztec, and they took away the wreckage of these accidents. As a result, the Greys were determined to demonstrate their determination and technology to the military in the air in Farmington. Wow! I heard Roswell. Is this related to Dulce? Of course, although Roswell is famous, it was just one of many accidents. Through subsequent communications, it was learned that the reason why the Greys suddenly began 
Regular flights was to seek new shelters because they were frightened by the ongoing nuclear tests in New Mexico and believed that humans intended to eliminate them. Are the Austrians related to these things? No. There is no connection. The Austrians have fully integrated into human society and, genetically speaking, they are closer to us than the Greys. However, they consider themselves to be descendants of gods and have a mission to enslave humans. I will mention more about them later. Okay, let's continue. Going back to the topic of Dulce, we had set up a temporary clinic. And only those who received treatment from us could board the train back to Lanel, as I mentioned before. What surprised me was that when we asked them to take the medication, no one dared to raise any objections or even ask what the medication was for, which revealed the high level of pressure in the facility. Some staff members experienced acute stress reactions after taking the medication, but they were quickly sent away. Later, I found out that the medication we provided was a high dose of propranolol hydrochloride, a drug used to counter traumatic events. Except for those with side effects, everyone else accepted our final interview, which was recorded and photographed. The facility's security department accompanied our work throughout the process, or rather, monitored us. After the work was completed, they expressed their gratitude for our professionalism and said they would contact us again for future missions. The entire mission lasted for two days, during which time I took every opportunity to wander around the facility. I saw many rooms and laboratories, and also saw the corridor that was discovered in 1940, as described in the briefings. However, all the symbols on the walls or other archaeological artifacts were gone and everything was brand new and flat. But I was not satisfied with this. I wanted to see the natives. I saw a security officer standing by smoking. When I entered the facility and I got to know him. So I passed him a cigarette and asked him how to get to the lower levels, and he looked at me suspiciously, as if he thought I had ulterior motives, and seemed to be identifying my identity. Later, he probably saw that I was able to execute the mission inside the facility without any problems with the confidentiality level, so he took me deeper. I saw an extremely huge warehouse with a circular entrance, and the floor and walls inside were made of a material I had never seen before, which looked like glass but felt like some kind of metal when touched. Then we came to a corridor that looked like an entrance to a deeper level. I could see a mirage-like scene there, and the heat emitted was very high, making me uncomfortable. The officer seemed to guess my thoughts and told me not to worry, that the place we were going to was not that hot. Then we arrived at a device, and he spoke into the intercom, then swiped his card and started scanning his face. And the door opened automatically, revealing a long corridor illuminated by soft lavender lights. There were many rooms on both sides of the corridor, but they were all empty, although I could still see many glass panels, and tables and chairs, and could see the cuneiform writing on the glass panels because I had seen some in the briefings, so I recognized them. We walked about a quarter of a mile, 400 meters, and all the way he told me to stay calm, as the natives did not like those who were jumpy. I read in the briefings that there were also factions within the Greys. And some of them were willing to join humans to live under supervision and management. They came to the areas above the third level and lived with humans. These guys were called the Dissident Greys, and I mentioned them before. They pursued peace, so they got along better with humans. The greys below the fourth level had less contact with humans and had a stronger hostility, so it was basically impossible to enter that area. Then he said that the natives do not use names. They only have a universally unique identifier, UUID, which is a system developed by a software service company outsourced by the contractors. It consists of 32 hexadecimal digits organized into five groups separated by hyphens in an 8, 
four 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 one two pattern, totaling 36 characters. This system is also tied to facial recognition algorithms. The greys print their UUIDs in barcode form on their clothing, while humans must use magnetic cards. The greys do not use magnetic cards because their skin is magnetic and can demagnetize the cards. I later learned that this complex system was developed by IBM. I asked him about the social structure of the greys, and he told me that they only knew the greys were highly fragmented internally. The main reason why dissenting greys sought help from humans was not because they wanted to cooperate with humans, but because they had been punished internally. And some were even sentenced to death. Because many gray bodies with obvious injuries or burns were found at the connection between the third and fourth levels, and these injuries were caused by lower level grays. Unable to return to their own population, these dissenters were very obedient to human leadership. During the conflict that broke out two days ago, they were the first to counterattack and help humans control the situation. Yes, due to the trust relationship, humans allowed dissenting greys to carry weapons and allowed them to return to levels below the fourth level at any time to trade with lower level greys. They also conduct genetic research, but humans limit their work to using plants, small mammals, fish, reptiles, birds, and insects for experiments. Do you know what animals they like to use for experiments? The official suddenly asked me. I thought for a moment and said, monkeys? He shook his head and said, no, their favorite animal to use is mice. 90% of genetic engineering experiments are conducted using mice. The most surprising thing to us is that they eat the mice after the experiments. Eat mice? I was very surprised. The official shook his head again and said, I wasn't very accurate. They don't actually eat them, but extract protein from the mice's mammary glands. They have a genetically modified mouse population that reproduces quickly and can provide them with enough uncontaminated protein. This protein is eventually concentrated into a powder and mixed with purified acid casein and milk. This is their energy source. In addition to mice, they have also started to study the proteins of other animals in recent years. Because only male mice do not have nipples, and they only like the glandular proteins in the nipple area of course, we do not know why they have this preference. As we chatted, we finally arrived at the door of a room. The official swiped his card and scanned it again, and the door opened. This room obviously belonged to the natives, because the furnishings inside were very different, and the materials used were ones I had never seen before. There were many cuneiform inscriptions carved on the metal tables separated by glass panels, and there was a faint purple light on the walls. I saw something that looked like a large notebook computer on the table, but it was just a simple glass panel displaying characters and emitting a dim light. The official's expression suddenly became very cautious, and he told me not to touch anything and to remain calm at all times. While, a, native, wearing a white lab coat entered. He was about four feet tall and had a rope hanging around his neck with a metal plate on it bearing a barcode and the IBM logo. This discovery made me feel surreal, wondering why a product that would never be known to the public had a commercial logo on it. My crude behavior was obvious, and the official loudly scolded me, Lieutenant? I then realized and nodded politely to the gray alien, but did not shake hands because the official had told me beforehand that they did not like any physical contact. He handed me something like a notepad, which was similar to the computer I saw before, just a glass panel, but not transparent and appeared black. The screen emitted light but I didn't know where the light source came from because it was so thin. I could write on it, and the translator could convert the gray alien's writing into human languages like English, Russian, French, Chinese, Spanish, etc., or output it as audio. 
The official tried writing a question, then clicked the tablet, and the gray alien's voice was played. This technology was beyond my imagination. And I didn't see the IBM logo this time. It was evident that this was not something that humans could invent. For the following decades, most of the technological advances made by humans were related to the technology provided by these gray aliens. Excuse me, Colonel, may I interrupt? Have you heard of Major Philip J. Corso? To make sure that all audiences can understand, it would be helpful to provide a more detailed explanation of who Philip J. Corso was. Some people may not be familiar with his background or his contributions to the field of ufology, so it would be beneficial to provide more information about him. Philip J. Corso was a retired United States Army officer. He was born on May 22, 1915, in New York City and passed away on July 16, 1998 in Daytona Beach, Florida. In 1997, Corso published a book titled, The Day After Roswell, in which he claimed that he had personally handled debris from the Roswell UFO incident in 1947, and that the U.S. government had covered up evidence of extraterrestrial visitation. Corso's claims have been both praised and criticized by those in the UFO community and the wider public. Yes. I have read his book about the reverse engineering of the Roswell incident. After reading it, I knew he had done this kind of work. The explosive development of human technology at that time, fiber optics, integrated circuits, lasers, all of these things were discovered in 1940. Also, the second generation of night vision technology was obtained from those UFOs. Many people wondered how humans couldn't develop night vision, which had been around since World War II. But in reality, the second-generation night vision device, such as Supergen, was entirely based on the technology of the gray aliens. When I saw the part about night vision, I knew Corso was not lying. He spoke the truth, but some authorities deliberately portrayed him as a fraud. I can tell you about the origins of this part. The gray aliens taught us what a microchannel plate was and the physics principles behind this technology. They showed us how to use the interaction of photons in a microchannel plate to generate electron charging pulses and how to couple these plates together to form an X-ray image intensifier. The U.S. military later mastered this technology and could produce it themselves. A prototype was already made by the end of 1957 but it was not made public to the world until after 1970. There are many such restricted technologies that have already been invented. How did Corso know about this? He didn't work at Area 51, but he was the head of the Foreign Technology Division for the Army and had contact with the Greys. His job was to pressure them through diplomatic means to provide technical details. Before Corso, the position belonged to Frank Wisner, a genius at interpersonal communication, whose previous job was to obtain technology from Nazi sympathizers before switching to the Greys. Unfortunately, Wisner committed suicide with his son's shotgun in 1965. There are many rumors about his death, but the credible intelligence I have received suggests that he was able to become the first diplomat to communicate with the Greys. Because he knew about them since the 1940s, and even traced his ancestry in Germany, so I suspect his death may be related to the Austrians. Wisner was sent to London in 1959. It wasn't until 1961 when Corso took over that communication with the Greys resumed. With Corso being selected because of the Horizon Project. This project is now widely known as a failed project. But in fact, its purpose was not to establish a military base on the moon but to try to restore the alien base on the moon. Our astronauts later saw traces of some ruins on the moon, and there is evidence of this, but it will not be made public. Starting from the crash event in San Antonio, the Grays flights in New Mexico were disrupted by our radar, 
and we obtained UFO debris as well as their special suits and equipment. The guys from the Department of Defense were eager to master this technology, but reverse engineering was very difficult. Because many things were already damaged when we obtained them, and we couldn't figure out the principles. So the Department of Defense began to pressure the Greys, proposing to use Earth's natural resources as exchange for their technology. At first, the Greys did not accept this kind of trade, so the military blocked the export of the facilities at Area 51 and deployed a large number of high-power radars nearby to interfere with their flights. The reason why the military dared to take such an intimidating stance was that the 1940 battle taught us that while the Greys were technologically advanced, they were not good at large-scale warfare, and their population was not comparable to that of humans. Under the pressure imposed by the humans, the Greys were forced to accept their demands, and the first and most valuable technology they provided was the integrated circuit. Yes. The most important invention in human history actually originated from the assistance of the Greys. The commonly known inventor of the integrated circuit, Jack Kilby, only received the Nobel Prize 42 years after inventing it. This was because Corso's book was only published in 1997 and drew attention from the public. In order to cover up the truth, the association awarded him the prize in 2000. Stay tuned for the next episode where we will resume our discussion on the Dulce Files.